There's actually a, a law case uh, about a, uh, the previous century in, in Britain where there was actually a, uh, uh, an attorney who went to court and proved the fact in a legal court of law in Britain based on their rules of law, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and he was successful in doing that because as we've been seeing, we're not just starting, we've been going through this for several weeks, as we've been seeing, there's overwhelming evidence for it. Uh, there was another fellow named uh, Simon Greenleaf who was a, a law professor at a, a tiny law school that not too many people knew about, but uh, uh, he was noted and then made that school famous because he basically wrote the volumes of book, the treatise that determines even to this day what is considered uh, permissible to bring into a court of law to prove your case. Uh, and his name, again, Simon Greenleaf. He was basically got tired of his students who were Christians telling him about Christianity, about Jesus Christ, and, uh, and came to understand that uh, uh, everything would rise and fall in Christianity based on the resurrection. If you could disprove the resurrection, then Christianity is, is, is really nothing. And of course, that's what the Apostle Paul says as, uh, as well. If it's not true, then... Uh, then uh, our, our religion is in vain and we are still in our sins. So he took a sabbatical, took it seriously, uh, and spent a year building his case to disprove the resurrection of Jesus Christ based on the rules of, uh, of law. He came back a year later as a Christian because he could not disprove it. The evidence was overwhelming. That law school, Harvard, he put it on the map because of his teaching and, and the, uh, the books that he wrote while he was there. Uh, so that's part of what we're looking at this morning as we continue on in terms of just the appearances of Jesus after his resurrection. But also it's, it's more than that because there's just, some, there's just some great scenes where Jesus comes in and ministers to the hearts of people. I mean, he doesn't just show up and go, I'm here again. <laughs> See me? Okay, good evidence. See you later. You know, and he does a couple days later. Ha, I'm here again. I've risen from the dead. See you later. No, he, he's, he's showing up so that he can minister to hearts of people. And, and we can't look at all of those incidents in detail, but we'll certainly look at uh, a few of them. So we begin in verse 9, chapter 28. Suddenly Jesus met them. These are the, the women. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. And we point that uh, Jesus' resurrection brings him into contact with the women leaving the tomb. Now, again, last week we saw that they were, these are the women who who watched him on the way to the cross. They watched him be crucified. They watched his side be pierced and the water and blood poured out, signifying by professional executioners that he was dead. Uh, they watched as Joseph of Arimathea, in a sense, risked everything to go to Pontius Pilate to beg for the body of Jesus, take it off the cross, and then tried to be buried quickly and get into his own tomb uh, just nearby where he was crucified uh, before the sun went down and the next Shabbat or the Sabbath came. They were there, they saw it, and now they come back the first day of the week after the Sabbath on Sunday morning, uh, and they find that the, the, the Roman seal is broken, the stone is rolled away. There's an angel that is telling them, Jesus is not here, he is risen, and so forth. And they then leave on their way in obedience to what the angel has told them to do. And they, uh, they run, into, uh, run into Jesus. That's actually not the first appearance. It's actually the second. The first appearance is to Mary Magdalene. And that's uh, recorded in Mark 16, 9. It also is in John 20, 17. There it reads, Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, to Mary, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told him uh, that... Uh, and she told him that he had said these things to her. So we might, uh, first appearance, and we might refer to Mary as the first, 
as the first missionary in terms of going to tell the news uh, of the risen Lord. And of course, as she does that, then the other women who had also been with her, we just read, have an encounter uh, with Jesus Christ. Uh, and, that's the, uh, and that's the second uh, uh, appearance of him uh, to these gals. So we'll talk about the significance of that in a moment. But just to point out the first thing he says to him in the English, we get uh, greetings, he says to him, but it could have been translated grace to you. Uh, and I think that's wonderful. What's the first thing that Jesus says in terms of his resurrection that we ought to know? <laughs> Grace. Uh, that's what it's all going to be predicated upon in terms of our knowing him and having a relationship with him uh, through his death and resurrection for our sins. Uh, and we notice that the women respond to Jesus in great humility in our text. Again, they clasp his feet uh, and worship him. I don't think there's any question about their commitment to him at this point as they're there uh, at his feet, hanging onto his feet. They are, they're worshiping the Lord. It says that they're worshiping him. And uh, I think that uh, this is exactly what Jesus was talking about when he was describing what worship ought to be like back in John chapter 4, verse 23. He there speaking to the woman, the Samaritan woman at the well, said, a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Uh, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. That is spirit as opposed to the flesh. Uh, that is in truth as opposed to being deceived. And I think that's what we have a picture of with, with these gals. I think as they, they came upon Jesus that morning, they didn't go, oh, there's the blessed Savior. And now do I put my left knee down first and my right knee down? You know, I don't think they were, what is the proper religious protocol for this? I don't think they were just on their face and they were hanging onto his ankles and just the natural thing. Notice they realize his true identity as well in that moment. They worship him. Uh, if you're Jewish, you don't worship another person. You only worship God. So they, they fully understand that he is just not the Messiah of Israel. He's not just the king that, that again, Matthew has been picturing for us. Uh, he, he is truly God, uh, and, they, and they worship him. And I think it's, that's a picture of what Jesus was speaking about back in John chapter 4, real humility and worship. The third thing, the women are to deliver a message to the disciples. They are to go to Galilee. Notice Jesus tells them, do not be afraid, go and tell. Pretty simple instructions. Uh, and and it, it indicates that there was a fear or would be a fear. And I want to suggest there still is. Uh, I don't think there's probably anybody here that every time they have an opportunity, every time it arises in a conversation, immediately jump in and begin to tell people about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, we would all agree that that would be the the logical thing to do, the thing we should do if we really cared about other, other people, especially if they don't know the Lord. But there's something that kind of keeps us from always doing that. And it's, it's a fear. Proverbs 29, 25 says, fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is, is kept safe. And so Jesus encourages these women to go and tell what they've seen. Now, again, the significance of it is this is that, um, is that uh, there was a rabbin I could go through a bunch of rabbinical sayings, but one of them would say it would be better to, to burn the Torah than entrust it to a woman. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, I, we could go on and on. Women in the ancient world did not have the same kind of standing that they have today. And they only have it where there's been a penetration of the gospel into that particular culture. If you don't believe me, go into a culture where, where the gospel really hasn't gotten in very well to that culture, and women do not have the same kind of standing and freedom and so forth that they, they do in our, our culture. Praise God. And that's, that's because of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ rises from the dead, and the first person he speaks to, we're all pretty clear this wasn't like an accident. Jesus kind of, oh, Oh, hey, Mary, didn't really mean to run into you here, but as long as I got you here, let me, that this is all very premeditated and so forth. And the first person that he determines to tell he has risen is a woman who's been possessed by demons, by multiple demons, and he's delivered her. And she has faithfully followed and served him uh, ever since that occasion. Her life has been radically changed. She's been radically set free. She is absolutely committed uh, to, uh, to Jesus Christ 
And he is, and it, she becomes the first one. Who's next? The other women that had been following and caring for the needs and part of this large caravan that we described to some degree uh, in one of our messages uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, Jesus takes and, and, and elevates who women are, and especially in terms of the gospel. Uh, they're the first missionaries. Uh, he's going he's gonna to let everything ride upon them going back and being the witnesses to his resurrection. Do the guys believe him? Uh-uh. <laughs> Sorry, they're guys. And, uh, and, and in, that, in that culture, a little, a little thick, and, uh, and they don't believe. And the response of Jesus, once he sees them, is he rebukes them for it, for not having believed uh, what these gals had to say. So the resurrection brings him into contact with women leaving the tomb, and that's our first two appearances. Uh, secondly, in verses 11 to 15, Jesus' resurrection causes the Roman guards to flee to the city. Uh, verse 11, while the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests and everything that, that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day, and it still is widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. A couple of things about the Roman guard. We notice that they flee because the, the seal, the Roman seal is broken and the body is gone. That was their responsibility. That was their, that was their duty. And if they didn't keep it, it would mean their death. It wasn't like a couple of slaps in the hand. We're going to kind of dock your pay for about six months. We're going to bust you down a couple of ranks. No, you're, you're executed for that failure to fulfill your, uh, your, your duty. Uh, and, and so this all happens. And, you know, we don't have an eyewitness account of, of the Roman soldiers. We know that there was, we said last week, a violent or a great earthquake. And we give you a couple of cross-references on, on that same word. Uh, obviously, anybody in Jerusalem experienced it, but they're, they're at the epicenter of where, where it happens. They have to know, even if they didn't see Jesus, they have to know that something radical took place. And obviously, the... Uh, the stone has moved away because they are aware of the fact that they're there long enough for the stone to be moved away. They're aware of the fact that there, uh, there is no body. It's also interesting that when they flee to the city, they flee to the Jewish leadership. Mm, that's not really who they work for, but that's who they go to. Why? Because if they go to who they work for, he kills them. If they go to their commander or they go to Pontius Pilate, who, they, who personally dispatched them for this very important duty, uh, then, uh, then they, they're, they're not going to live very long. So rather than to go who they would normally go to, should have gone to, they don't go to him. They go to uh, the, the Jewish leadership, Caiaphas, uh, and those that were concerned about the resurrection of, uh, of Jesus Christ. So they flee because of the resurrection. And thirdly, uh, the resurrection requires the corrupt Jewish leadership to explain the, the missing body. And in, in and again, that's just not my opinion that they were corrupt. We've covered that in, in Jewish history. Jewish historians write about how corrupt they were uh, at that time uh, as well. Uh, this is, again, Caiaphas, his father-in-law, Annas, that basically ran the city, become wealthy off of it and so forth. And, um, and they've, they've got some explaining to do. Uh, they give an explanation because we say they refuse to believe the resurrection. I mean, you know, think about it. Jesus rides in. The people hail him to be the Messiah. They're quite aware of all the miracles. They have been sending official delegations up north to Galilee to test him with questions, to find out who he is and so forth, as was their responsibility. Uh, and now he's in the city. These things are happening. Uh, and, uh, and, of course, uh, they are the, uh, the driving force behind his death. Uh, they did not want it to be on, uh, uh, during the feast, uh, but, but it was. And certainly they're not totally in control of these events. But even at this point, they get the report. What was their concern? Their concern was we needed a Roman guard. We needed a, a Roman seal on the tomb so that nothing would happen. Nothing would come of this idea of Jesus' public pronunciation that in three days he'd be killed and in three days he would rise again. 
Everybody knew about it. They were well aware of it. And now they get the report. He's not there. He's risen. Oh, we better fall down on our knees and worship him. No, <laughs> they, it didn't matter. Uh, the, the evidence and what happened really didn't matter to them. So their explanation also involved not only their disbelief, but soldiers uh, getting a large sum of money. And, and again, it doesn't say how much, but again, the, uh, the adjective there is, is large. And, um, and, then, and then they have to develop this, this whole story. But again, the, the Roman soldiers may have realized that they had a little bargaining chip here. Yeah, if we go back to Pontius Pilate, we're going to get killed. Let's go to the Jewish leaders because this seemed to mean an awful lot to them that no one knows this happened. And we're, we're the witnesses. We're the credible witnesses as far as they're concerned. If we go to them and we tell them what happened, they might be willing to give us a few shekels in order to go along with whatever story they might, uh, they might come up with. And uh, they end up profiting from it. And then thirdly, the explanation involved a story that disciples stole the, the body uh, in the night, which, as I said, is still circulated today. And if you listen to a debate on the resurrection of Jesus Christ, if you listen to some of the arguments of those that are the, quote, higher critics and uh, liberal theologians that don't believe in the errancy of Scripture, uh, that might name the name of Christ but are not a really not Christian, uh, one of the arguments they will give that Jesus was a good man, he was a good teacher, he was a great rabbi, so on and so forth. We should live according to his teaching. We just don't believe he rose from the dead because after all, it was just the disciples that stole the body. Keep in mind that these four Roman guards could defend 100 square feet, 10 by 10 by 10, and hold off the four of them back to back, historically be able to hold off 100 people attacking them. We've got <laughs> Peter and the boys who are scared to death. And the best they can come up with is two swords. And even when Peter tried to use it, he missed the guy's head and cut off his ear. He's not real skilled at it. Uh, and they all ran. But somehow, somehow, they've mounted the courage, right, to, to get their two swords and those 12, 11 guys and go take on these Roman guards that they're very familiar with, how, uh, uh, how skilled they are with, uh, with their weapons. Uh, they managed to get the courage and go down there uh, and it just so happened that even though they would face death if they did it, they were all asleep. Again, if you went to sleep at your post, they would sleep in shifts, but there would always be sufficient guard posted. And if there weren't, again, all would be executed. But they just all happened to fall asleep. Then all they had to do is manage to figure out how to get the stone moved. So maybe they bring another seven or eight guys and some big levers and some equipment. And, hey, be kind of quiet with that. We don't want to wake up the Roman soldiers. You know, and they're moving this huge thing. Right. But I mean, this is how preposterous this idea is. But that was the story. That was the best thing that they could come up with. The fourth thing about the resurrection, it's confirmed by his personal appearances uh, to the disciples. We've already mentioned the first two to the women. Number three is a private appearance to Peter. And, uh, and again, recorded in Luke 24, 33 to 35. But Paul mentions it in 1 Corinthians 15, 3. For what I received, I passed unto you uh, as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scripture, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter uh, and then to the 12. So why, why Peter and why privately? Well, I think the, the obvious answer is that uh, uh, Peter probably needed it at this point. Again, Peter didn't, you know, when, when Jesus says, on this night, you know, all of you will fall away from me. But Peter's job, well, they'll all fall away. I'll never fall away and, and so forth. And he's still just kind of the big fisherman and the, you know, braggart, I can do it all. I'm not like other guys and, uh, and all of this stuff. And then we have his denials. And after the third one, as Jesus predicted, and the cock crowing, then you have in the, basically the garden area before the gate, coming off the front porch, Jesus now marching out after his three illegal trials in the middle of the night on the way to Pontius Pilate, he makes direct eye contact with Peter at, at that point. At that point, Peter goes out and weeps bitterly over his denials. Uh, and now the news of, uh, of Jesus' resurrection. The gals come and tell them. He and John, remember, they run to the tomb. John is, just happens to mention He's a little faster, gets there first. 
Peter barges in behind him. Peter goes in and he sees that the grave closed. Again, it would have been a mummified figure of Jesus out there like a cast, but there's no body in it. Peter, again, the Greek word says he theorized about what all this meant and went away trying to figure out what does all this mean? John goes in and he sees that and it says he saw and he believed. Peter still doesn't. You think he'd have enough evidence by now? And so, and so, and so Jesus appears to him privately. And, and, uh, and obviously we don't have that conversation, but, but um, yeah, it allowed Peter to some uh, point of restoration, some encouragement from Jesus. He understood that Jesus still cared for him and, and loved him. And I think we could all appreciate the fact that when we fail Jesus Christ and we fail uh, in, our, in our relationship with him and how we're to represent him to others and the words that we say and the attitudes that we have, I think we can appreciate the fact that Jesus doesn't you know, write our sins on the wall as we come in here on Sunday mornings, that he actually comes to us privately uh, and deals with our own hearts and attitudes with the intention of, always a restoration and always bringing us to a point of forgiveness. So I think we can appreciate the private meeting with Peter. The fourth appearance is with the two Emmaus disciples and Luke 24, 13, also recorded in Mark 16. And it's a lengthy text. We won't read it, but you know the story. These guys are leaving. They're downhearted. They're downcast. They have no hope at all. Uh, the, um, they're having apparently a, a very heated discussion with one another. Uh, the text there says, uh, Jesus walks up and says, what are you discussing together? And it means they're having a very heated discussion over the events uh, that have just uh, transpired. Uh, it says they stood still, their faces downcast. Now keep in mind that they were aware of the empty tomb. They heard the witnesses from Mary, from the other Mary, from the other women that that not only had the appearance of the angel and the explanation, they, they saw Jesus as well. They don't believe it either, and they're walking, uh, they're walking back home. Uh, again, you comes to mind you know, how much evidence does a person need. But again, uh, the problem was not in their head. The problem was in, in their hearts. And uh, they say, <laughs> are you the only one living in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened? Uh, Paul says this before King Agrippa in Acts 26. I'm convinced that none of this has escaped his notice because it was not done in a corner. In other words, the two to three people all know about it. Where are they from? All over the Middle East. I mean, they've got to come. They're coming from all over, not just Israel. They're coming from all over. All of these people are there and everybody knows about it. They know about Jesus, the rabbi, who was hailed as the Messiah when he came in the week before, who was so kind and so compassionate and fed the multitudes and did the miracles and raised the dead. And everybody knew about Lazarus. But they also knew the confrontations that took place in the temple every day and the arguments and the debating that Jesus entered into with the Pharisees and those that sided with this corrupt leadership. Everybody, no CNN, but everybody knew about it. And they also know that now he's been arrested and his crucifixion, though crucifixion was common, this was different. And Paul mentions that, that you, Agrippa, I know you know about this. It didn't happen in a corner. Everybody was, was quite aware. And so Jesus shows up and says, uh, so what's happening here? <laughs> what things? <laughs> and, and then they go on and, and begin to uh, explain. There in verse 19, it says, they say he was, verse 21, we had hoped uh, they had lost hope. And Jesus says, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had, had spoken. When is enough of enough for you to finally make a commitment to, to, to place your faith in what the scriptures had said uh, all along? How does Jesus bring restoration to these guys? How does he bring hope into a hopeless situation? He takes them to the scriptures. Uh, again, they had information, but not, not faith. Uh, Pasquale, the great mathematician, said that human knowledge must be understood to be believed, but divine knowledge must be believed to be understood. I mean, you, you know, basic, basic things, uh, human knowledge, you, you've got to have a comprehension, understand what you're reading, what you're talking about before you can kind of get your mind around it and go, yeah, that's true, I get, I get that. But um, so often in God's word, God's way, divine knowledge, it's got to be believed first before it can really be comprehended. That's why a person that's born again of God's spirit 
can read God's word and have it minister and speak to his heart and so forth and encourage him uh, and show him where he's wrong and where he's right. But at the same time, somebody else can read it and it's just history. Uh, and these guys needed something. Verse 27 of that text in Luke, it says, And beginning with Moses and the prophets, he, Jesus explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So he begins. Where does he begin? Genesis 3.15, the first promise of the Messiah. Where did he go after that? Oh, I wish we had that Bible conference. <laughs> to, to have Jesus tell us every mention of himself through the entire Old Testament. As these guys are, it's seven miles. They had time as they were, uh, as they were uh, walking along. Uh, the, the results, they say, were not our hearts burning within us. Warren Wiersbe says, receiving Bible truth and walking with the Savior will lead to a burning heart. And we're not talking about Zippy's chili here. We're, we're talking about something intrinsically going on where we know that that's, that's right and that's true. And I get it and I understand how it applies to my life. It says they got up at once and returned to Jerusalem. So now they become witnesses of the resurrection as well. Number five, Jesus appeared to the ten after that in the upper room in Jerusalem. Again, Judas no longer on the scene. Thomas is not with him for this first um, uh, meeting there in the upper room recorded in John 20 and Luke 24. Uh, in verse 37 of Luke 24, it says, they were startled and frightened thinking they saw a ghost. <laughs> Again, they really don't believe the words of of the women yet, they've got the witnesses of the guys on the Emmaus Road, but they're afraid. I mean, they're still afraid of Pontius Pilate. They're afraid of possibly being crucified themselves. After all, they're part of the Roman conspiracy that led to the, the death of Jesus. And then you get Jesus that shows up in an upper room that's locked, and he just steps out of, again, uh, the time-space continuum and steps into it, and he's suddenly there, and, uh, uh, and they're afraid. And the first thing that he says is shalom or, or, or peace. And it's Mark's gospel that tells us the first thing he does is rebuke them for not believing the testimony of the women. Luke puts it this way in Luke 24, 38. He said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is my myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. He shows him his wounded side, his, his feet. And then there's a couple times he does this. Then he says, you guys got anything to eat? And he sets down and just, just does something totally normal uh, with, uh, with them. Uh, that's good. I think that means we get to eat in heaven. I, I'm not, uh, I could probably give a couple other references for that, but uh, at least I like the idea, the concept. Uh, uh, with no guilt eating. We eat now, but there's... Limited to what you could eat. Got to count those carbs and calories. Looking forward to that. Uh, and Jesus says to, to touch him. Now, this is important for a couple of reasons because it, it shows us that the Jehovah's Witnesses and most New Age cults uh, are false because they deny the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. They say that Jesus rose in a spirit form as a spirit being. Jehovah's Witnesses teach that. It's part of their uh, basic doctrine. Of course, there's many other problems that they have. They deny the deity of Jesus Christ and so forth. But a lot of the New Age cults uh, teach this as well. Uh, and then what does he do? I mean, how, again, how does he bring hope into a hopeless situation with the disciples on the Emmaus Road? How does he encourage these guys? He's rebuked them because of their unbelief. It should have been enough. I mean, how much evidence do, uh, do you need? In fact, at one point in John, he would say, and blessed is he who has not seen and still believes. By the way, that's us. And Jesus says, in a sense, that's a greater blessing. But he's kind of rebuking these guys here uh, for their unbelief. But then he ministers to them. Why are you downcast? Why are you troubled? How does he bring faith to them? Again, he takes them to the scripture. Verse 44, he said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the, the scriptures. He takes them to the word of God. That's probably a good thing for us. Downcast, struggling, no hope. Uh, let Jesus take you to the word and go through the scriptures. Uh, he also does something very important here. He basically validates the entire Old Testament because he, he covers the historical books, the poetical books, and the, and the prophetical books. 
basically, he's, he basically, when he wants to validate his own identity and who he is, he goes to, again, uh, the, the Old Testament. Number six, Jesus appeared to the 11 disciples and dealt with Thomas' unbelief. So this is a week later, recorded in John 20, 24. Now, Thomas called Didymus, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. <laughs> I'm sorry, he just cracks me up. I, I have to reflect on Jesus praying all night before he picks these guys, you know. And, uh, and I... And, uh, and, you know, and uh, praise God that Jesus picked one skeptic. I mean, a, re a real skeptic. Uh, back, back in John 11, uh, they, they've, at that point in time in the ministry of Jesus, things are getting kind of hot around Jerusalem. And the death threats are out. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of the drama is building, you know, with the, uh, the, the Sanhedrin and, and uh, Caiaphas and Annas and so forth. And Jesus will use a line sometimes. He'll say, and this is not my time and so forth. And what he does, he takes the guys and he, he heads out of town. He gets out of Judea uh, and goes to an area out of their jurisdiction. And in a sense, he's He's kind of still training, teaching, getting them prepped for the events or, of what's coming up uh, and, and so forth, including his crucifixion. And then he gets word that Lazarus is sick unto death. Messenger comes, Jesus delays his coming, uh, and he's obviously going to decide to, to go back. Now, if they go back, I mean, there's a death threat on them. If you come here, if they go back, that death threat is still there. Uh, Sorry, this cracks me up. <laughs> John eleven fourteen. So he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Then Thomas called Didymus said to the rest, not to Jesus, but to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. <laughs> I just want to suggest that's a sarcastic remark. <laughs> you know, Jesus, Jesus, Lord God is saying, come with me. We're going to go do the, oh, yes. Lord's with us. He'll protect us. You know, everything's good. <laughs> no, no. Thomas is going, we go back there. We're all dead. Okay, I guess we're going. Uh, but anyway, it's Thomas. I, I'm just glad that of all of these guys, and he's got some characters here, as we've all come to appreciate over this uh, study over the last year and a half or so, uh, Thomas is definitely the, the, the skeptic in the, in the group. And so Jesus comes uh, the next week and, of course, appears before them again, and Thomas is there, and he does apparently touch his sides and examine the physical evidence, and then he gets down on his knees, and in John 20, 28, he says, he says to him, my Lord and my God, Thomas gets it in terms of the true, not just that he's risen, but his true, true identity. He was God come in the flesh. It all, it all comes to him. And I love, I love Thomas, and, and uh, he's... And uh, love talking about him, and, and I it just it's been a real privilege. To, the the two trips that I've made to to India to both times have the little Thomas connection there. The first time uh, was uh, we were uh, in Madras, uh, Mike Single and I <coughs> doing a bunch of teaching and conferences there, and we got to see the hill where Thomas was martyred for his faith. Again, Thomas is the apostle that takes the gospel to India, uh, and it was tough to get a flight in those days. You know what I'm saying? I don't know if you looked at the map recently, but that was a long ways away. And, uh, and, but he, he goes probably further with the gospel than the Apostle Paul. And, uh, he makes it into southern Europe and everything. But um, uh, in southern India, there's uh, one area called uh, Carolin, and it's called the, uh, the, the Venice of Asia because it's just massive waterways. By the way, that's where K.P. Yohanan is, uh, is from. Uh, and, and that area down there is, is about the only state in India that has a large percentage of Christians because the gospel got there so early through, through Thomas. And uh, on another trip, we were there and we were able to, again, Mike and I uh, went uh, to one of the, uh, the churches established by Thomas. Obviously, it's a different building and so forth, but that, that was the chunk of uh, land. That was the piece of property where he established, uh, I think about, they say seven and a half churches because he got martyred, you know, in the middle of the next uh, in the next church plant. But Thomas goes from uh, the radical skeptic. I mean, he's there. He's part of the whole thing. He's one of the boys. But uh, uh, they, there's probably more, more remarks that he made than the ones recorded in Scripture. And even after all the, it's not like a couple of the apostles saw, they all saw Jesus risen the week before. He says, I still don't believe. 
but when Jesus appears. So these appearances, again, uh, two things that we, we want to certainly see and understand is that Jesus had a purpose in them. He wasn't just showing up and go, huh, here again, more evidence. Okay, see you in about a week. Uh, no, he was ministering. Uh, he was trying to encourage and restore people's faith, restoring Peter. We'll look at it in a moment to, uh, to actually uh, ministry and a sense recommissioning him and so forth. But, uh, but everybody that had this experience, their lives were completely and radically changed. And that's the other factor in terms of the evidence of, of the resurrection. It couldn't just be a story. And we'll talk about that more at the end. We'll talk about the conclusion. But it couldn't just be a story because their lives were so dramatically changed. A skeptic like Thomas takes the gospel all the way to India and is willing to be martyred for his faith rather than to de deny the Lord. The seventh one, and there's only about 26, so hang with me. No, I'm going to go quickly in a moment, but actually, I'm, I'm not going to cover them all. I'm covering 13. The seventh one, Jesus appeared to the disciples frequently, and that's in Acts 1-3. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. So uh, many appearances uh, over a period over 40 days and certainly one of those experiences, as I just mentioned, recorded in John 21, is with, with Peter again in, in particular. Uh, again, Jesus has said, go into Galilee and wait for me there. Now, they, they've seen him. Uh, they've seen his uh, resurrected body. They've spent time with him, had a meal with him a couple occasions. But they eventually go, they go back home and uh, go back to Galilee. And, uh, and they're there, and uh, they're supposed to be waiting for the Lord and then Peter, of course, at some point in time says, well, <laughs> maybe he's not coming today. Let's just go fishing. And so they go out, you know, and they, professional fishermen, they fish all night when you're supposed to fish on the Sea of Galilee. Uh, and, uh, and then they come in and there's somebody on the beach. Did you catch anything? No, we fished all night. Haven't caught a thing. Throw your nets on the other side. And they do. And of course, the nets are ready to bust. And then they kind of look again and Peter goes, it's the Lord. <laughs> and then he folds up his mumu. You know, I mean, he's got this, he tucks the thing under his belt and, you know, jumps out. He goes to meet Jesus. And Jesus is on the beach, uh, you know, uh, cooking, you know, breakfast for him. Cooking fish. Tilapia. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. It's, you know, you go to the Sea of Galilee. I don't know if the fish changed over, you know, the last two centuries. But if you go to the sea, that's what's in the Sea of Galilee. It's tilapia. I mean, you go there, you do the tour, you do the, the boat on the, on the Sea of Galilee, which is <laughs> very cool. And then you come in and you kind of have, have lunch there in um, Tiberias. In, and uh, if you get St. Peter's fish, that's, that's what it is. Of course, everybody from Hawaii is going, that's a tilapia. But uh, it's a different, didn't grow up in a muddy canal. It's, uh, <laughs> but anyway, so Jesus is there on the, on the beach cooking tilapia. And, uh, and, uh, and you know, I, I, I more picture him like uh, getting the sticks and building the fire rather than go sticks, psh, fire, psh, you know, and then fish. Psh, I think, you know, I don't know how he did it, but he's there cooking and they come in. And then he and Peter has this conversation. Verse 15, when they had finished eating, uh, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, uh, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. Yeah, you know that I love you, Jesus said. Feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, uh, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time. There were some about third times, about threes that were kind of set Peter off for some reason. Uh, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I, I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. A couple things that are a little bit cryptic, but we kind of get the, the gist of the whole thing. But first, uh, Jesus begins, uh, uh, Simon, son of John. Now, what did Jesus normally call Peter? Peter. I mean, he changed his name to Peter. Uh, but here he goes back to his former name, the name that was used when he denied the Lord. Uh, this, was, this was all about what happened. I'm going to use in your name that you used when you denied me. And I'm going to ask you a question three times because you denied me three times. Uh, and the first, the first time he asked him, again, we kind of lose it in the uh, English translation, but he uses the first two times, agape, unconditional. Jesus says, Peter <laughs> or Simon, son of John, do you love me unconditionally? And then and, and Peter says, 
He uses the word phileo. He says, Lord, you know, I'm really a, your good friend. <laughs> now, what Peter might have said before is that, yes, Lord, I love you unconditionally, and I don't care if any of these other guys don't love you unconditionally. I'll be the only one. I'll always love you unconditionally. That was the old Peter. It's a different guy. There, there's a different guy here. And, um, and, and, and so Jesus comes back again that second time. Do you love me unconditionally? Well, Lord, you know I'm like your really good friend. I really, really, really like you. And then the last time Jesus says, Peter, do you really, really like me? Do you phileo me? Lord, you know all things. You, you know that I do. I, I just, you know, again, Jesus is, is trying to get to the heart of, of Peter. Jesus wants to restore him to a place where, where God can use him again. So does, so does he does us. But it's not just, hey, you really blew it there? Ollie, ollie, oxen free, no problem. No, God comes in and says, what did you do and why did you do it? And have you changed and have you repented? And do you have any plans on doing it again? Are you really humbled by it all? Are you broken? I'm really broken. Praise God. Then God recommissions us uh, and sends us out once again. Notice the instructions, feed my lambs, the little ones that need tender, loving care. Peter, uh, you're kind of a big, brawly guy. Are, are you going to be able to do this, show some kind of tender, loving care to others? It's Peter that writes later, uh, above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. This is not the same guy that was, that was denying the Lord. Uh, it's a different guy. Uh, second, take care of my sheep. Not just care or tender care or even feed or teach, but you, you need to be concerned about uh, all the areas of their life. You need to be concerned about people. And then the third thing, to feed my sheep, not just the younger ones, but the more mature ones uh, as well. All of the boasting is, is, is gone. Uh, Robertson A.T. Robertson, a wonderful Greek scholar, says that, uh, but here Christ probes the inmost recesses of Peter's hearts to secure the humility necessary for service. And he does through the seventh appearance. The eighth, he appears to over 500 at once. That's, again, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 8. We've read a portion. Uh, but the rest of the passage says, for what I received, I passed on to you as the first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures that he was buried, that he was raised the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as one abnormally born. So this, uh, again, eighth appearance over 500 at one time, and this uh, kind of deals with the theory or the objection that uh, these were apostles that were very distressed and seeing Jesus were actually hallucinating. I'm sorry, you don't get 500 people all having the same hallucination all simultaneously. It just, it just doesn't happen. And, uh, uh, and here we've got probably this mountainside uh, uh, experience that Jesus said, go into Galilee. And this is probably it. There's 500 of them. Uh, and, uh, and obviously more than just the apostles and the other disciples and, uh, and so forth. And it says even uh, in another place that some of them even doubted until that time, until they, uh, until they saw. This is, uh, Paul's writing uh, 20 years after the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which then helps us with another, one of the more recent theories to try to dispel the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that is that it's simply... It's simply just a fable or mythology that came later. Uh, the disciples of Jesus Christ, they wanted to carry on. They would say his teaching, his compassion, the, uh, the teaching on the Mount of uh, Beatitudes and so forth. Uh, and, uh, and so in order to perpetuate uh, this idea of him being a great teacher, they had to develop the idea that he died and that he rose again. Now, the problem with that, it's too soon. It, it takes a, a couple of generations. We could still say today, an event as far back, this would probably really date some of you, but we could begin to say that uh, John F. Kennedy was not really assassinated. That was just a myth that was perpetuated for political reasons at that time so that we could institute the next guy in power. And the problem with that, there's too many eyewitnesses that are still alive. And that's a lot longer than, I think that's more than 20 years ago. <laughs> 
because I was, I was a small child at the time. <laughs> uh, but uh, here, it's 20 years later. The heart of the preaching from the very beginning is the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you hear someone say that, it's not something that came later. It was there from the very beginning. Uh, nine, Jesus, again, appears to James, his, uh, his half-brother. We see that in verse 7. Ten, Jesus appeared to all the apostles, uh, and certainly he appeared to to the 12 earlier, but apparently, and again, there were many apostles in the book of Acts. Uh, Paul, Timothy, Titus, uh, Andronicus, Junius, Epaphras, and we could go on and on. Many other men were mentioned as apostles. And Paul says, and the Lord appeared to, to all the apostles. So we have other appearances that we don't have those details on as well. 11, he appears to Stephen in the book of Acts as Stephen is basically preached a, a very eloquent message giving, uh, the, reciting the history of the Jews there in the synagogue and proving that Jesus is the Messiah. Uh, and what they did is he takes him out, stone him. He becomes the first martyr uh, of the faith, Acts 7, 54. When they heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. Do people still do that? Gnash their teeth. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And then you've got Paul mentioning the fact that, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. And uh, we know the story of the Apostle Paul. And uh, I think it's really key to kind of place this together in the book of Acts. What does the book of Acts really, really focus on? It really focuses on the apostle to the Jews, Peter, very early on. And after that, it focuses on the Apostle Paul, the Apostle to the Gentiles. You got Peter, the denier, and a, and a, a wonderful testimony of the grace and, and the compassion and the restoration of, of his life through the power of Jesus Christ, resurrection, and the Holy Spirit. Who's the other guy you got? The persecutor of the church, the guy that was killing Christians the guy that was beating men and women to try to get them to deny their faith. And it wasn't enough to do it in Jerusalem. He gets letters so he can go all the way to Syria where there was a fairly large Jewish population. And on the way, you know the story. Paul just, it came to him in the scriptures. He just really humbled it. <laughs> no, it was, God knocked him off his donkey and, uh, and blinded him. Uh, it says in Acts 9, as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. So again, these appearances, what a blessing to, to think about. And, um, and whatever, whatever condemnation the enemy might bring us under, uh, whatever we might think about how God can't use our lives or he tried, but I wasn't faithful or whatever it might be. I don't have the education. I'm too educated. I'm too cynical. I'm too, th I'm sorry. There, I think all the bases are covered here. Uh, and uh, and this, isn't, this isn't all the believers. This is just a few of the boys uh, here that we're, uh, we're going over. And certainly the last one, number 13, the Lord's ascension. Again, not all the apostles, but many are there as they see the Lord uh, rise in, into heaven. Again, the, uh, uh, the last thing we want to look at is that the resurrection brings us to an important conclusion. And certainly, um, and it's been stated very accurately that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the most easily proven fact of all antiquity. Uh, any, any other thing you talk about, was there a guy named Aristotle that really lived? You know, well, there's a lot more evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ than that in terms of documentation, the Bible, as well as outside the Bible. Josephus writes about it, uh, other, other historians, uh, which, which we don't really even care about. We're, we're over the top at this point in terms of, of the evidence for uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But it should make a difference. And, um, and, and the point of these appearances is the fact that all of these men's lives were changed, and that would be enough. That's a weighty thing right there. But not only that, they were all martyred for their faith. And to their last breath, 
refuse to deny Jesus Christ. Uh, John the Apostle is the only one that, uh, he only gets boiled in oil and in a, in a, a couple of really great things like that. Uh, he ends up dying an old man, but still tortured for his faith, but he doesn't deny the Lord. Because again, one of the other theories the critics come up with is, is that these guys got together and developed this concept, this idea that we'll say, we'll say that Jesus rose again from the dead. Uh, and as long as we all stick to our story, uh, we're, we're okay. They developed this little conspiracy, conspiracy theory. There's actually been a couple of books uh, written, written about it. <laughs> I want to show you a couple of pictures <laughs> and, um, and a little, little interaction here. And, uh, and just talk about this idea of, of how this is not even, even possible, this idea. And, and uh, don't say it out loud. Anybody recognize that building? This is going to date some of you, or you're just a good uh, his, history student. But if you do, just kind of raise your hand if you know what that building is. Uh, if you don't yet, you might get it on the next slide. There's a uh, former president in front of the White House. Anybody know what the building is now? Uh, uh, there's a few, I had a few in the, in the last hand. There's a few nods to heading. Nobody wants to go, I'm that old. I know. What's, what's the next slide? And anybody know who that guy is? Well, that guy's name is John Dean. And the building that you saw was the Watergate. We have that phrase now. We have all these, if there's a scandal, we say it's this gate because it all goes back to the name of this building. A turning point in American history. Uh, and, and, and that's worth a, another whole discussion. But our point here is the fact that if you don't know, the, the DNC, the Democratic National uh, Committee, held their offices in this building, and the Republicans, some of them, for some reason, felt like it would be important to know what they were thinking and what's in their files and so forth. So they sent in a team of burglars in to scope out the, the files. They couldn't just hack the computers in those days. They actually had to go look at the files. They get caught. They get caught, and it turns out that one of President Nixon's top advisors basically orchestrated the deal, hired him and paid him and so forth, and they know that they're going to point the finger at him. All of the men, the president's men, top men get together, including this fellow John Dean, and they basically say, listen, if we just say we don't know anything they're talking about, as long as we stick together on our story, we can deny the whole thing, we can shelter the president, and this thing will all, all blow over. We just got to stick to our stories, like the apostles, the critics would say. Uh, the problem is, is that it lasted two weeks. And then this guy went in and turned state's evidence and said, I'll tell you anything you need to know. I just want to save my own neck. I don't want to go to prison. John Dean, he's the guy that uh, turned in. One of the other guys who got arrested is this next guy here. Anybody right? That's Chuck Colson, president of uh, Prison Fellowship Ministry. And if you didn't know, now you understand how the ministry began. <laughs> got in prison right before that. Someone gave him a copy of C.S. Lewis. Uh, mere Christianity. He reads it, puts the evidence together, very brilliant guy, and receives Jesus Christ. Uh, their whole point is that their little conspiracy couldn't hold together for more than two weeks. Was their life threatened? Were they going to be executed over the... No. They were going to suffer some political embarrassment, and some of them might go to jail for six months, and probably a nice jail. Uh, and that was enough to make one of them go, no, I got to tell you the truth. But all the apostles went to their death uh, confirming the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Colson in an interview would say this later. The Water, Watergate cover-up reveals the true nature of humanity. Even political zealots at the pinnacle of power will in the crunch save their own necks. Even at the expense of the ones they profess to serve so loyally. But the apostles could not deny Jesus because they had seen him face to face and they knew he had risen from the dead. No, you can take it from an expert in cover-ups. I've lived through Watergate that nothing less than a resurrected Christ could have caused those men to maintain to their dying whispers that Jesus is alive and is Lord. And not only them, but countless thousands and perhaps millions have gone to their death, refusing to die the resurrected Lord since that, that time. The evidence for who Jesus is and his resurrection is, is overwhelming. 
Has Matthew done a pretty good job here? I mean, not all of you have been here for this whole thing. But if you go back to the genealogies, he's kind of walked us through this whole thing. It's overwhelming, uh, isn't it? Uh, and, and, and it's amazing. Again, I think of the Winston Churchill line of that, how some men stumble over the truth but manage to dust themselves up, get up and walk off as though nothing happened. And, uh, and we certainly don't want to see, see that happen. I think the, uh, uh, the, that incident just becomes a, a great turning point is, is uh, uh, the authority of the office of the President of the United States then is, is looked upon with disdain and question and it leads to or helps a whole movement that questions all authority uh, in, in this country. It's, it's, one of the, it's one of the game changers uh, in, in the United States in terms of history. Uh, but for us, we certainly can learn from the, the words of Chuck Colson here. There's no way that these guys could have gone to their death if they had not seen Jesus face to face.